morning and welcome to this week's edition of Tourismus Namibia. As you can see on the screen there, my name is Frank Steffen. I'm the editor of the Allgemeine Zeitung and then obviously also responsible for Tourismus Namibia. Like I said, welcome again this week. Loads of news. Uh, we Under topics, we bring you different items this time. Uh, we talk about uh, beer and we also talk uh, look at the Earth Day that was and, and stuff that's uh, connected with that. And then we also have a sable antelope that seems to be doing its own thing. Um, and then obviously next we'll have destinations. Under destinations we look at two sites in Windhoek, the first one being uh, the, the safari villa in, in Windhoek. And if you look at the videos there, we were, we were talking to these people obviously. And then uh, the second destination we visited was um, Haus Schwerensberg, uh, Schwerensburg, sorry, uh, which is obviously one of the German castles that we've got in town. So finally then, uh, further down the line, under the, uh, um, to the point category, we bring you a little teaser about the film that uh, Earth Alliance has made. So yeah, quite an interesting show hopefully, and uh, I hope you will enjoy it. First up, we obviously have topics. <laughs> Welcome back. Yeah, one of the things that we pride ourselves in, in, in Namibia is the fact that uh, we've got the German beer tradition going on. The Namibian breweries obviously uh, uh, only brews by the Reinheitsgebot, which is the German rule that uh, you, you only uh, uh, use the hops, barley and malt and, and obviously clean water and no additional chemicals are being added to that. And um, so what we have uh, this, uh, this time is, uh, well, not this time, actually yesterday, we had the, uh, the, the day of the German beer. Now this is just a little uh, background to how the uh, breweries in Namibia came to be. And, uh, but basically what it is all about, uh, the German uh, the day of the beer is always on the 23rd of April, while the International uh, Beer Day is always in, in August, uh, supposed to be always on the 1st, but I think this year they actually do it on the, on the 5th. Anyway, so um, you can see the brewery over, over time has grown quite substantially, and Jereen Hoff actually took a little look at the, um, at, at the beer as such. The history of pure beer began in 1516. At that stage, it was considered a staple food. However, enjoying it did not come without risk because all kinds of things had been used for making beer, including poisonous and intoxicating plants. Monks and nuns who relished beer preferred to use hops instead. It gave their beer a pleasant bitter taste and made it last longer. Monks and nuns were expert brewers for a very good reason, because for the 40 days of Lent they were not allowed to eat. However, drinking beer was allowed. The Bavarian Duke at the time took a liking to beer, but he also wanted to protect his citizens from dangerous ingredients. So he issued the Purity Law, stating that only barley, hops and water was allowed for making beer. This recipe for high quality beer began to spread all over Germany and eventually the entire world. This was the beginning of the Reinheitsgebot. The beer enthusiast in you may ask why yeast was not mentioned in this recipe. But the truth is, back then, they simply didn't know about the role of yeast in the brewing process. Because beer was usually produced near bakeries, where the surroundings contained more yeast than usual, it worked perfectly fine. But if other microorganisms found their way into the beer, the brew could quickly become completely ruined. Today beer is produced in modern breweries, but even the latest technology hasn't changed a thing in the purity law. What bears the Reinheitsgebot label? will always only contain barley, hops, water and yeast, 
with no artificial additives. Beer produced under the Reinheitsgebot has become famous throughout the world and is a hit wherever it is consumed. The EU even declared it as a traditional food. You may wonder if only four ingredients can become boring after a while. But if you have a look at the beer landscape, the answer is no, simply because there are more than 100 types of hops, 40 kinds of malt, and over 200 yeast strains. Even the origin of water may have an influence on the taste. Mix these together in the right blend and you get a smooth bitter pulse, a barley malt, bitter with aroma, hops, wheat beer with fermented yeast, wheat malt or craft beer with the new citrus hops. There's literally something for everyone and for every taste. These ingredients and the brewing expertise allow a country like Germany to produce more than a million types of beer. You could literally try a different beer brewed under the purity law each day for 15 years. Right, and then uh, up next we have got another day, and this one for tourism is obviously much more important as far as I'm concerned for this program at least, that is. And we actually had the uh, Earth Day on, on Friday, and, and what made this, uh, as you'll see here, I got this uh, uh, Twitter message up. And uh, so Namibia's fuel commissioner in the Ministry of Mines and Energy, Maggie Shino, took part in a discussion on national and continental fuel supplies on Wednesday. This is all as part of the Namibian uh, energy conference that was held this week, which was just a th thinly disguised uh, gas and oil conference as far as I'm concerned. So the controversial exploration company Recon Africa promptly tweeted a quote from Shino and she said, I can assure you from the government side that we exercise control, which is why the negative reports of environmental damage by Recon Africa regularly brought by the media are untrue. So this was her opinion and uh, Shino had uh, admitted before during a parliamentary standing committee meeting on natural resources that it had taken effort to get Recon Africa to comply with Namibian regulation. We reported about that at the stage and uh, you will remember that we also spoke about it on the show. So speaking to the uh, um, stock market uh, scare, I would always almost say Viceroy, Shino warned at the time and said, companies operating in Namibia are not allowed to use oil-based drilling mud and must only use environmentally friendly fluids in all activities. So um, now Recon Africa always uh, um, promised us that they, uh, that they will supply the information of and the exact data for the product that they used because they had obviously drilled up there and used the, that mud and stored it in a, in a, in a um, basin that, didn't, that wasn't properly lined and uh, thus the water actually just seeped into the ground. So just in time for Earth Day, the organization's Economic and Social Justice Trust and uh, Nafsan have put together a fact sheet, as they call it, in which they record the entire history of Recon Africa and Namibia, including the risks and the damage that has already occurred. And um, the big thing was always, and, and I know that the government uh, doesn't like the fact that uh, fracking seems to be on their mind at all times, but the fact is that Recon Africa sold their project as a non-conventional project, mainly non-conventional project, so to, to now go and say there will be no fracking just is not true. And this is typically the area. This, uh, these photos are made, it was a young elephant who tried to show off and storm us in the hideout in which we were sitting. But it was just like you can see, it wasn't real serious and it always came short of, of the hideout. Uh, but it was interesting to see. And this, these photos were literally made no more than probably 100 kilometers, not even, at 60 kilometers as the crow flies uh, over to where the one drilling site is in, in Cowdham Park. So um, it would be sad if we, if we can't see this anymore. And this photo I made last year in October, so or these photos. And um, it just goes to show Earth Day, very important. I think uh, um, you also saw that uh, Frack Free Namibia, they did a bit of a march on, on Friday and all, all to, to demonstrate against Recon Africa. Because at the end of the day, we want our Earth still usable. So that's our, the, our second topic. Um, next up, we've got a very funny item. 
Um, there is a sable antelope that decided that the Sossos needs to be its new home. It's, uh, it, uh, this photo was taken by Jan Friede and it was on, the fa on Facebook. And um, so, so we brought this in the Allgemeine Zeitung. And it's actually quite funny because the, the, the sable antelope obviously is currently in and around the Sossos flay. And it obviously causes a stir uh, in, in the other way, otherwise dry flay, especially since the natural range of these antelopes several hundred kilometers east or north of Sosa's flay, more in Kaza. Um, and so Romeo Muyunda of the, uh, the Ministry of in, uh, Environment, Forestry and Tourism, he, he reckoned it must be from a close by farm. And in fact, there is a farmer. Uh, Albert Falk, who, who actually reckons that it could have come from his farm and uh, would literally probably walk down the Tsaukhat River, which ends in the Sossos Flay. So anyway, quite a little novelty there for you. Right, and those were our topics for, for today. Up next, we've got destinations. Right, welcome back. And uh, our first destination was uh, are the Safari Villas. Well, Safari Villa, I should say. It's a little uh, guest house. And um, uh, Desiree Cases, you might remember, she joined me on a previous show. She went there and they had a look. And if you look at there, I actually indicated on the map, you can see the road leading up to Okahantia. So as you go into town uh, towards the city center, the main road, Independence Avenue, as you drive into town, you would turn off at the Heliodor uh, intersection, Heliodor Street, that is. And um, the, you would go right down to MediCity, that hospital that is further down. And the right, if you look at the next photo, you can see it more clearly. Uh, there I indicated Heliodor Street. And as you go up, you can see you've got to turn left on the, on the street and take another turn left. And then you're basically there already. So I prepared a third one just to make it a bit more. Here on the front bottom, you see uh, the hospital. That's MediCity and those, uh, the, the big red roofs and so on. That's where you turn left and then left again. And then on the next uh, section, you will see Safari Villa Boutique. So uh, this uh, villa is... Um, it, it, it is owned by Mareike Lamprecht, and uh, she's not only the owner, she actually runs it, and it's, it's like I said, in Eros. And she, she took uh, Desiree around the house a bit, and as you can see, it's very nicely furnished, something totally different. And uh, just remember that the, this show is not only about showing people who come here as visitors to, to spend their holiday. We obviously also try to, to introduce uh, these sort of... Uh, places which are close to hospital on the one hand and still offer all the amenities that you would want to have. So uh, quite nice to see that this is actually quite really nice. And it's got, um, yeah, it's, it turned out to be a five a guest house in Vintuk. So that is how it is rated, uh, five star apparently. So well done to them. And if you ever want to go there, this is where you can go. Now Desiree obviously also prepared a little video clip for us. Good day Desiree, very welcome here at Safari Villa. Um, joining us today here on the veranda again, lovely, lovely day outside at Safari Villa guest house. So um, you asked me to when we started and how it all started. It's, it was in the COVID times, that's obviously the worst time to think of possibly getting a guest house. But we never knew it's going to be lockdown and all of all of that. So I started three days before lockdown. The sale went through and we got the guest house. And still, it was a not a guest house at that time. It was just a, somebody's residential house. 
and by day by day how we had money and cash I started redoing all the rooms and just making it a little bit more piece by piece my own and we started with the name Safari Villa going on forward that we have guests from all overseas and this is the idea of Safari Villa is that when you start or end your tour through Namibia which is a beautiful country as you all know that you can stop or start it here at the villa so we can fit you at the airport and from there on we can do all your bookings for you if you want to go to the Caprivi or to Sosasvlei or to the coastal town Sokopmund and we can work out your entire itinerary help you with your statement your places we would like to stay all around uh, Namibia and it's just a safer way for people to travel these days so when you just get to one place here's a car collecting you with your itinerary and it's from A to Z the whole thing is sorted so that's how it started and through the whole lockdown like I didn't have a lot of guests so I had to start thinking what I'm going to do else and we started having little functions baby showers, bachelor, bachelorette parties and Desiree you have been to one of these and we have it between 10 people or 50 people as you wish and we would lay beautiful tables we normally do a feast table that we make the whole table there is full of uh, lovely snacks and you help yourself or we even have a huge barbecue area and you can rent it for a year in function the whole, the whole guest house and you can have your prize barbecues here at the villa with your friends and clients we also have a fully stocked bar that's open for whenever you would like to join us. We have a heated pool, which is lovely. So it's uh, the winter is approaching, so that would struggle a little bit, but it's still lovely to lie there in our very lush and green garden and just to read your books. We have fully, we are fully stuffed with lovely ladies here at Safari Villa that will help you with all your needs. Uh, have a glass of wine next to the pool, have hamburgers, pizzas next to the pool or just chill which we love to do here at the villa what else can i tell you so we've been going on for two years and as i say in the beginning it was hard through lockdown and COVID, but in a sense we had lots of time to get everything straight all our planning and what we wanted to do and sometimes life just pushes you in a direction that you didn't plan um, and that ended up being with the functions and the events and now it's one of our favorite things to do how many how many rooms do you guys have here and what type of rooms do you offer so at this current moment we do have nine rooms which is one is a, is a flat but you can rent with your own kitchen and your uh, lounge area two rooms fully equipped with a washing machine that's small for people that to us through the country and stop just before they leave to go somewhere else just to do their washing and things like that um, and that one is for two th am I allowed to give the prices <laughs> all right that one goes for two thousand dollars a night for the old flat then I have a bachelor flat single room which is our standard guide room which works very well since we are also in the hunting industry I have lots of hunters bringing their guests here so I run a special that all the hunters stay here for free while they get the guests pay and the guests have their dinners here and lunches here and then as I say my tour guide stays for free as if he brings his clients to Safari Villa. That room is for 600 if you are not a, um, a, a professional hunter or tour guide, tour operator. Um, and then I have luxury rooms that's in the, in the guest house that differs from local prices for people from 1200 for a couple to 1600 for a couple that is my overseas price and yes like I say you have room service we are fully equipped chef with breakfast lunch and dinners that is our good thing that's happening here um, with other guest houses you have to you book in you get your breakfast and then you have to go to town um, to do your to get your dinners and so and with a lot of older people and that's not comfortable going out at night yeah they don't have to drive around they stay here and we look after them the whole time until we take them to the airport this right and something else that we just started recently is the patrick mavros um, shop they this uh, if you can have a look at my hand these are a boutique collective boutique that sells wonderful wonderful jewelry all handmade and crafted from zimbabwe 
and it's animal things and different things. Come and have a look. So there's a massive shop in town close to Gustav Frucht Center. But as you can see, we um, have a little, a little Patrick Navarro shop in our guest house. So I would just like to show you, this is very interesting. There's only five of them in the world, which is in Kenya, Namibia, uh, Nairobi, Zimbabwe, Mauritius. And here you have the pangolin. This is the pangolin group. And everything is made of silver. And as you can see, I just want to move slowly. Um, this is based on all our lovely animals in our country. And the percentage of this goes to the foundation of the Pangolin Foundation. Or right, and that was the, uh, the Safari Villa. And up next, we've got Haus Schwerensburg. Haus Schwerensburg, uh, that was uh, done by Elizabeth Joseph, another colleague of me of mine and uh, obviously this week we seem to spend time in Windhoek only but so be it it's right in the center of town if you look there the other day we spoke about National Botanical Gardens as a possible uh, it's worth a visit and there you can see that little circle there that's where the German churches and then obviously Tintenpalast which is our parliament and then there right at the bottom you see how Schwerensburg so if you it's, it's almost, uh, if you would, go to, to Gebabes or come in from Gebabes or airport, that's where you would turn left there at the main intersection and then immediately left again uh, to end up in Haus Schwerensburg. So um, just to give you a little indication or easier view of where it is. Now, it is, like they say, in the heart of the capital and it boasts extraordinary views, obviously, because it's right up in the mountain. It's one it's right next to that uh, little castle there. And um, so it's beautiful views and finishes that are really nice. Owner and manager, Henri van der Merwe, says that they want people to visit the establishment and see that there is more than what meets the eye with them. And here you can see her in the photo. And um, so Elizabeth obviously visited her and had a little look at her guest house and like you can see it's it's a quaint little thing with little ideas and differences uh, that make it something special um, and again it's uh, more on the luxury side but um, obviously we don't always just try and promote just a certain type of uh, guest house or lodge and this is I think something uh, more personal and yet in the price class where um, you need to accept that you obviously need to pay. But like I said, look up on the internet and then you have a look at what, what they have to offer. And yes, in this case, Elizabeth also supplied a video for us.
Eva. Um, we're living in Vintuk, our Schwedensburg guest house now lately. Um, we moved into this old beautiful place back in 1999. It was very old, very um, neglected and we, we just have a passion for this and the whole family and everyone thought we were crazy by buying this place and um, actually and then luckily my husband and I have the same vision um, and we are in the construction business so we love doing this uh, renovating and just make of some nothing something so from the beginning we didn't think of doing it making it into a guest house so we just took bit by bit and as we got money we renovate a little bit and a little bit and so we started off with a family, raised our three beautiful daughters here and then um, oh yeah, we always have a guest room open for, for guests, we love people, we love guests and it was one evening when one of our friends was staying with us, um, it would have been only a week and then it turned out to be weeks and it was lovely having him here and he was asking us why didn't we why didn't we consider this one day when the kids are moving out of the house and yeah, why don't we do this? And because we're doing it so naturally and I thought, but oh well, if it's gonna be can be the same, then we will love it. And then when we started to do the, the rest of the, the house and, and with the, the actually the west side of the development and with a nice view and then we decided but you know, it's too beautiful just to keep it for ourselves, you know, and then the, the seat the, with that guy's um, comment and with that we decide that, you know, it will be so wonderful to share it with other people as well. So um, we love staying here as well with the guests um, because then we can really attend them 24-7. Um, it can become tough, but, you know, if you see it as a, as a, as a purpose or as a as a calling, calling and not a not a job, then it become a lifestyle. So we love it. We we, we love meeting new people. We we I know the Lord sent us the most wonderful people here to meet us and to meet them. So um, yeah, that's where it is now. At this stage, our children start moving out of the house. So at the end, we look at to have seven to nine rooms at the end. Um, and do the whole, the whole property into a guest house and build um, a small, like a granny flat for us to stay because it will be necessary for someone to stay on the premises to attend the guest 24 7. So, yeah, that's our big vision. So, and we are planning to do the, the, the second phase now by the end of this year, um, depends on how the figures look like. So, yeah, that's it. So, our heart is just to share present God gave to us, gave to us to share with other people. Um, the rooms, um, we have five rooms at this stage um, and it includes just bed and breakfast. So I, the, the rooms are, I think, nice. And so it, it, it will be a, a, a joy to, 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 for a guest to stay there. Um, and I think um, yeah, we, we do offer for regular guests and for business people that stay for a week or so. We sometimes offer dinner as well, but they, that's not a la carte menu. It's like only cooked meals. So, and we have those, those kind of guests quite often. Um, and then we also do functions, small functions, um, sit down functions. Uh, um, can, we can do till 30 people. Um, cocktail functions can we can go up to 50 people um, it depends on the weather it can sometimes be quite windy sometimes it's a beautiful day like today so um, yeah and then we can do baby showers and, and bridal showers and um, intimate pro uh, birthday pro uh, parties or, or celebrations we also did um, in COVID time a lot of um, life celebrations, intimate life celebrations. So yeah, that's that's what we have to offer. We don't do day visits um, because we want to um, protect the privacy of our guests. 
So we're not very keen on having outside people hanging around here and making a party here at the at the swimming pool. So that's not really the feel or the the ambiance that we want to want to have. Right, those were our two destinations for this week um, and then coming up next is to the point. Yeah, talking about to the point, um, to the point we are in fact uh, because like I said on Friday was Earth Day and uh, one of the important parts uh, was that I looked a bit into different uh, ways and how people approach this and then I stumble, stumbled over Alliance Earth. And uh, Alliance Earth, one of the directors is uh, Jeffrey Barbie, and some of you might remember him. We had him on a previous interview quite a number of uh, months ago, and he spoke a bit about Kaza. Kaza obviously being the Kavangu Zambezi Transfrontier Conservation Area. We've also spoken about that a lot. And that is obviously the area that is most affected by this new drive to, to look for oil on shore. Um, with Recon Africa being busy up in, in Kavango, but make no mistake, in Angola you see the same thing, and going down the Zambezi towards uh, Zambia and, and, and Zimbabwe, you, s you find similar challenges. So oil is suddenly the, the big uh, El Dorado for everybody. But be it as it may, Jeff, uh, actually he and a, a colleague, um, they directed and compiled a film that they will be releasing uh, and it's called Wilderness Beyond Borders. And uh, here's a little trailer to, to make you understand what it is all about. This is a mosaic of wilderness and subsistence agriculture, where a million people farm on marginal land exposed to seasonal variability that is the hallmark of climate change. This is also elephant territory. An estimated 140,000 elephants, more than a third of Africa's remaining population, call this area home. People and animals share this landscape and the futures of both are linked to water. Now there is a plan to drop national borders and allow everyone to roam without passports across this region where five countries meet in the heart of Southern Africa. It is a plan that helps Southern Africa's water-stressed countries deal with the effects of climate change by restoring the ecosystems of two major river basins. Assisted by the South African Peace Parks Foundation, the five African countries of Angola, Botswana, Namibia, Zambia, and Zimbabwe agreed in August 2011 to create the Kavango-Zambezi Transfrontier Conservation Area. 
called the Casa Park. It is 29 million hectares, an area about the size of Italy. This new plan creates a framework to protect and share these nations' precious water resources and combines the interests of wildlife and people toward a common goal. The big objectives of the TFCA and of the Peace Parks Foundation is to facilitate the process where you look at the management of integrated ecosystems across international boundaries. The foundation is a facilitator for a dialogue between all of the stakeholders in the region. We help governments in each of those countries initiate a process where you bring together private sector, communities and government around one table and say, okay, but what do you think is the future of this area? This integrated approach to conservation is vital for semi-arid countries facing the combined challenges of food and water security at a time of climate change. It is also vital for protecting the migration routes of the wildlife, and both of these elements are essential for creating sustainable livelihoods in the area. Anwas, they are very important because they make our area beautiful and they keep the ecosystem going and also they bring in the tourists, thereby giving money to the community. One of the pillars of the Kaza project is the official protection of the Zambezi and Kavango rivers. Well, a transboundary river basin, the way I define it, is uh, when water, the natural flow of water, intersects an artificial jurisdictional barrier. The former colonial powers used rivers as borders, whereas the previous pre-colonial dispensation used rivers as means of transport, as means to connect people. Africa inherited the borders that were created during the colonial era. But the Casa will break down these artificial boundaries and apply a management system that treats it as a whole, helping to secure these two great watersheds from the ravages of climate change, deforestation, and overconsumption. If our national economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of our national hydrology, then our global economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of our global ecosystem. So ecosystems matter because actually this is the life support system provider for planet Earth. So both these river catchments are unfortunately located right in the subtropics and that is specifically the part of Southern Africa that is projected to dry most. This is also the region of Southern Africa that is projected to warm very rapidly. And these are absolutely drastic rises in the surface temperature. The area is already experiencing climactic changes that are making farming more difficult. Max is from the Etza community in the northwest of the Okavango Delta in Botswana. Before people could rely on farming, nowadays they, they can't because uh, the rainfall here is more variable. We used not to have rainfall in winter like June, July. For the past two years we have experienced rainfall in those months. That shows that the climate has changed a lot. Community conservation systems in Botswana, like the Jakocha Trust, where Max works, are being used to shape the creation of the Casa. It's very important that uh, we implement the Casa plan so that we can try and manage our resource here. It's not just about wildlife and conservation. It includes communities and rural farmers in the overall land use plan. It can be uh, community areas, it can be game management areas, it can even be agricultural land, providing that whatever is practiced is done in a responsible manner, not to the detriment of the environment in the long term. By creating financially beneficial alternatives to farming, the CASA plan creates an appropriate, whole system approach to sustainable land use. The tourism industry is already the biggest employer in the area. Everybody involved hopes that the creation of the Casa will bring in even more visitors, and in this way bring jobs, training, and a new future to the people who live in and around the boundaries of this vast park. Victoria Falls is the park's centerpiece. 
Here, the Zambezi River flows into the Batoka Gorge along the border with Zambia and Zimbabwe, through Mozambique, and out into the Indian Ocean. The falling waters will take months to get there, and on their way, they will sustain millions of people. As climate change causes this region to warm up and dry out, the very lives of the many people who rely on these two great rivers are in the balance. One of the important things that the Kaza type of thinking will help bring about is a reinforcing of the human rights of those very marginalized groups by the emergence of uh, a transboundary management of shared natural resources such as water, such as landscapes. As it starts to face the reality of a changing climate, these forward-thinking ideas in transboundary management are being accepted and understood on a regional level here in Southern Africa. Instead of having a park where the community is asked to move out of the area, you have a system where the community remains in their area and they are given the rights to manage the area and manage the wildlife to gain an income to benefit their community. The elephants have already started to expand their range into the new areas of the park, taking advantage of new water sources in Angola during times of rainfall, or keeping close to the riverine highways in Botswana when rains are less certain. And as such, they are a living example of how best to take advantage of a variable climate. Yeah, right, and that was a film by, by uh, Jeff Barbie and his colleague, and um, it's something that you can actually probably look forward to. Um, I'm certainly doing it, and um, knowing Jeff the way that I know him, um, I think I should maybe invite him for another talk on this show again, and uh, maybe just talk about this whole principle, because Jeff is not only involved, uh, you know, obviously being uh, Alliance Earth, he's not only involved with Kaza and Africa, um, he is busy with other projects in Africa, but also in South America and other sites. So we'll, we'll have a look at that in one of the coming editions of this show. This brings us to the end of today's show, so I hope you enjoyed it and uh, hopefully uh, you will still have quite an enjoyable rest of a Sunday and I wish you a good week ahead and then we see each other in another week's time on, on another Sunday as we always do. Until then, remain healthy and look after yourself. Bye. Mm -hmm.